Welcome to NJASA's Frontline Leadership for Extraordinary Times video podcast series. Our special guest today is Senator Teresa Ruiz, who was elected to the New Jersey Senate in 2007 and represents the 29th Legislative District. Senator Ruiz serves as Senate President Pro Tempore, is a member of the Senate Budget and Appropriations Committee, and is chairperson of the Senate Education Committee and the recently formed New Jersey Education Recovery Task Force. Senator, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. And before we begin, how are you and your family doing? We are blessed. We're healthy. We have a roof over our heads and we're trying to pitch in uh, wherever we can. Uh, working from home, as you know, is, is double duty time task, three time fold. If it's a, that's a new tongue twister. If you have kids that you have to teach at home as well. But thank you for having me on and thank you for the work that you've been doing on behalf of the association. It's great to have you today. Yes, we're all, I think, working longer hours because of all of the need to reach out uh, electronically and through podcasts and through uh, video meetings. And so uh, we'll be looking forward to uh, back to the normal when we, can, when we can get there. Let me talk to you about the New Jersey Education Recovery Task Force that you have assembled. Uh, it consists of a diversified group of our key educational stakeholders. I'm pleased to be a part of that group. We've been meeting weekly and working on developing guidelines and recommendations to address the COVID-19 challenges that students, teachers, parents, and administrators are facing. Please give our audience an update on the progress of the committee and maybe some future projections that you see. So I think it's, it's been an extraordinary undertaking and you've witnessed that. Every week we get together and we stay on, on a, in a meeting in a Zoom chat for at least an hour and a half to two hours. Everyone's engaged, everyone's motivated. The key issue is like everything else, we're in uncharted waters, right? This has been uh, unlike anything else we have experienced since it's almost redeveloping our academic school settings in a venue where we don't know where there's the light at the end of the tunnel. And so I think the key purpose for the education task force is to collaborate with experts who are in the field and on the ground and create, help the Department of Education create a blueprint for when in fact this happens, if it happens again, we can all go to a shelf and at least have a uniformed uh, standard, right? Every district likes to do things in their own independent way, their own unique way. But what was unique during this time frame is that I heard from districts loud and clear that they wanted direction and they wanted guidance. And that's, that's completely understandable. People are concerned about health and safety of both their students, families, and their employees, and that's the number one priority. But how do we continue to develop academic strategies around that focal point? And I think that we're doing a phenomenal job. We've heard from teachers on the ground, both in districts that had a real seamless approach from classroom to living room teaching environments. We heard from teachers who are struggling. We heard the number one issue that has become for me and the fact that we're still talking about it and we're two to three months in, families and students who don't have access to technology or infrastructure to learn. I mean, that's a low hanging fruit for me. We should get past that hurdle and at least be connected. You know, we're hearing questions about budgets, which is what the topic of discussion will be today. We're hearing about what will school look like in September. And so I don't think anyone's looking for the right answer. People are just looking for guidance. And, and you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. Who knows if we turn around in, in November and say, we didn't need to do all of this. Well, it's a learning curve, but at least we've worked collaboratively strategically and most importantly in a safe manner because that's the number one priority for me when you think about restrictions and, and the loosening up of what's been happening most recently how can you apply that inside of a classroom it becomes very difficult to create a systemic approach where you can have four-year-olds in a classroom six feet apart in a small space to begin with um, with masks being worn the entire day and so you need to peel back and figure out how is that day going to look like come September. You know, you're hitting on so many of the issues that are on the minds of superintendents. I just had a meeting with a group of uh, superintendents in Morris County before we, we got on, on this uh, conference video. And, uh, you know, they're dealing with all the, certainly the digital divide, not as much in Morris County as other places, but food distribution, obviously learning loss, taking care of children with special needs and trying to do that remotely. So many issues, but one of the ones that's coming to the top of the list are social, emotional, and mental health issues. How do you see the task force uh, looking at those issues? 
So that will be one of the subject matters that we deal with in the weeks to come to bring in experts and, 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 and national folks to see if they can help us create guidance. I mean, this is something unique. I don't know if you've heard it from any of your professionals on the ground, but I have uh, friends who are social workers and they're really developing their own platforms to deal with with what's going on. And it's twofold. In, in, a, in a scenario like this, it's social emotional uh, learning and training for a student who could be dealing with just the fact that they can't be around their students, right? And then that gets compounded. How about the child who has potentially, uh, during this time frame had significant loss in their family? plus they can't go to school, plus the new normal is looking extraordinary. And so it's a lot to deal with. And when you think about it, and, and you think about specific areas of the state of New Jersey, where so many other elements can compound to that, certainly we have to have a better framework in place. And I think that there's uh, things that we have to make sure that we provide to protect the teachers who are doing this, right? So can we do more telehealth? via our school platform-based settings, what requirements are in place, what professional development can we offer our teachers, what can we do to create the most comfortable environment when it's just an adult and a student uh, behind two screens. And so it's huge unanswered questions, but I think that in, in the next hearing, when we get people in to talk about it, I think we could at least create a framework that, that allows for more uh, more flexibility in certain circumstances and that provides resources in a space where we have a need to develop that kind of strategy before. You know, coincidentally, as we're talking, we're talking about these needs, graduations, for example, has been a big issue and uh, eighth grade promotions and others. Something flashed right across my screen that Governor Murphy is announcing that there will be some form of in-person in uh, graduations, which is very interesting. That ground has been shifting. Uh, but certainly would contribute to this need that people are feeling to uh, to, to get together I and to celebrate. I think he's going to announce things. that tomorrow. Is that correct? Well, I just saw something come across the screen now. So it's it's uh, some news is out there, which is interesting because it's been a great question of, among schools. How do, how do we get this done? Can we get this done? And to parents and their students, it's been uh, really an emotional issue for them. So the ground is shifting, as I like to say, as we keep moving on. So we talked and about, I think, and uh, I think that to, yeah. so, Dr. Baz, I think that brings a, a, a unique point to what academics are going to look like, and so we're going to have to ask for patients on behalf of every community that makes our school networks, our parents, our teachers, our staff, our administrators, and our students. Because several weeks back, it was just digital graduation. Uh, this week, we might hear that you can develop your own. Um, a pub, you know, socially distant, safe environment, in-person graduation, whatever that may look like for whatever school district in the state of New Jersey. And three weeks from now, it might change to something entirely different. And I think that that's what we're going to hear. But I think that what's important is that while that may work in certain circumstances, when it comes to budgets and it comes to our academic enrichment programs in the summer, specifically for our special needs students, we need to get that advice and counsel right now so that we can develop and strategize. A superintendent that gets information in mid-July, you know that is fairly far too late to create a, a, a robust academic school environment starting in September. And so what I think what I'm calling for is just to, you know, if we have to be extreme, be extreme so that districts can develop and be prepared. And if we scale back, we do so during that planning strategy, but to wait and then just give districts just a couple of weeks to prioritize, to develop, to order PPE. I mean, it will be an extraordinary feat that I don't think any district will be able to, to do on its own, even if they, they, they want it to at 100%. You know, and I spoke with, as I mentioned this morning, about your advocacy with the governor and uh, the commissioner to, to that sense of urgency there. You know, I'm, I'm impressed as we listened to the health officials last week uh, and then listened to our superintendent colleagues on the committee as well as others about the logistical concerns, the financial concerns in terms of how do you sanitize, how do you get equipment, can we get equipment? Uh, we know now that budgets will at least be flat. I, I'm concerned that they may you know, be even cut back. I know Governor Cuomo just said over the weekend, 20% cuts likely for municipalities and school districts in New York. And given the shortfalls that we're hearing, obviously that's a concern. So looking at all of those issues, it, it, it starts to sound as though September is a very unpredictable time. And uh, as you say, people are looking for answers on what they can do. 
I'm, I'm beginning to come to the mind that maybe we should be saying that we continue virtually until we have sounder advice that allows us to know that people can return to a healthful and safe situation. What, what are your thoughts about that? So my personal thoughts, and this might throw everybody in for a whirlwind, that's, that's where I would. I would just make the determination now so that we can um, better prepare our teachers. You know, we lose sight of this and we take for granted the professionals in the classroom, assuming that they have the equipment that they need in their household to give the most robust um, setting. Um, you know, it's, it's, if we're going to do that, we should do it. And maybe, maybe we do it from September to November or early December, right? And then take a visit back or give some flexibility to districts who might go on alternate schedules where certain kids come in on certain days, if in fact they're able to do that. But it will provide several things. It, it would at least give a backstop as to what September is gonna look like. And then superintendents can start to prepare almost backwards. What do I need to make this happen? What do I need in October to make this happen? If in fact we're gonna have people in the building, what type of PPE can I have? There are thoughts and conversations about, you know, bringing in professionals back into the building and, and so that this way they have their network of resources available to them. But that would require also set up camera setups. Can we expense some of the CARES funding act for that? And then still teaching uh, remotely, but from their classroom environment. I mean, I just feel like, like you, there should be just a definitive answer sooner rather than later so that we can strategically plan what September is going to look like. And of course, this is what I keep telling everybody. No decision is going to make everyone 100% happy. When people sc were screaming about, please tell me what we're, we're going to do with graduation and, and the guidance came out that it was only digital, a lot of people were upset. And that's... 100% understandable, you know, you've waited your entire life to see your children, you know, walk across that stage and meet that guidance. And then now it's changing and, I, and I'm happy for that so that we can experience some kind of sense of normality and, and achievement and a goal setting that way. But not every decision is going to make everyone happy, but a decision has to be made. And I think that's part of the difficulty here. And, and so I agree with you, just, just call the shot and let districts decide. I, I just, even ordering PPE for an in-classroom setting in September for a school district, I don't know where, where, where you find the stuff to get here in time and where you draw down on your, well, your CARES funding, I guess you can use for, the, for some of that for the districts who did receive that money. But, you know, I just, I, I am in agreement with you and that's my own personal opinion. I'm not the governor or the commissioner of education. Yeah, I think we have to remind people that because everybody's looking for answers, but that's where they have to come from. So our advice is important. Senator, I've always appreciated your advocacy, your, your vigilance and caring for our children in this state and for our educators. Uh, before we close our conversation today, do you have any thoughts that you'd like to share with our listeners and our viewers? I do. And Dr. Baza, I think you, you know, you've known me for over a decade and, and this is something that it's interesting that the things that I've been screaming about for years about education are really coming to the forefront. Now you have communities who've never understood what learning loss talking about it, but my students have always known that we're number one in the country for public education settings. And when people get up at a podium and project that I get very upset and disappointed because it's a lack of recognition and the truth of who we are here in the Garden State. Until every single zip code can stand up and say that we're number one for every single child, that is a fallacy. It's not a true picture. And so what this pandemic has really created was a clearer lens into communities who have been struggling with digital divide and learning loss and food insecurity, because it's risen so much to the top. I think that for some of us who've been talking about it all the time, at least we have other members of policy making decision tables and other administrators saying, wow, we can't, you can't turn a blind eye to this. This is something that's a tangible problem that exists. And for me, because I have to find hope in all of this, when in fact we get back to a new normal, the things that we're doing today should not shift. So every student has access to a tablet. Awesome. So every family has access to free Wi-Fi who can't afford it. Amazing. So parents are more connected with the teacher and blended learning via technology. What are wrong about those things? We are, we are hopefully during the summer and in the academic year going to create programs to bring up the students back from their learning loss, whether it's 
an after school extended day or a summer academy or, or a, a rising uh, summer school program for the next year. What's wrong with keeping those policies and strategies in place that really surfaced from the pandemic, but are actual great resources for the entire classroom across the entire state of New Jersey. And so I'm hoping that while we deal with the immediate and then with the, with the, with the middle ground of bringing our students up to speed, that the last bucket is how do we recreate a new public school system that is equitable for every single student in the state of New Jersey. So well said, Senator. I, I think this is an opportunity we can't afford to lose. And I know our association is working together with the Principals and Supervisors Association to rewrite our vision for education. And we'll be right there beside you in support of those goals. So thanks for spending so much time with us today. We really appreciate Thank it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. And to, our, and to our viewers and to our listeners, thanks so much for being with us today. Remember that we will be doing one video podcast interview per week. So please monitor your email, visit njasa.net and subscribe to our NJASA podcast. Until then, I'm Rich Baza. Please stay safe, stay well, and remain healthy. 